new viewers, to those of you who are viewing us uh, later in a video, I'm really glad you can join us. And for those of you who are here live, thank you for joining us for another Consent Dojo. Consent Dojo has been going on for a year and a few months now. And here's the thing about Consent Dojo. It's about building up our muscles for consent, which it requires muscles. Initially, first steps feel simple, kind of like walking into a dojo and learning how to stand. And then we realize that standing is actually harder than we thought and the nuances and context. So we have a lot of tough conversations, which I really enjoy. I will be the proxy for all y'all. And I will also be uh, sharing the, the questions that are coming in from you. So consent is straightforward and incredibly complicated. It does require practice and regularly understanding about this and thinking about it and doing it. Uh, it's my delight to get to facilitate this. I don't actually teach in this. I facilitate because there are many incredibly wise and experienced people in specific areas that have much to say that I also have much to learn from. So it's been great. And today I am delighted to introduce to you Lee Harrington. And for those of you who are already Lee fans, you know, speak up in the chat. I'm gonna read the official bio, but let me start with this. So Lee Harrington, he and they pronoun, is a spiritual and erotic authenticity educator, gender explorer, eclectic artist, and award-winning author and editor on erotic and sacred experiences. He brings a combination of playful engagement and thoughtful academic dialogue to a broad audience. And they, and they believe we are each beautifully complex ecosystems who deserve to examine the human experience from that lens. From Sydney to San Francisco, British Columbia to Berlin, Lee has been teaching and talking about self-love, sexuality, psychology, faith, desire, and more since 2001. We do go back a while, don't we? Yeah, we do. It's wild, right? Yeah. Lee has been a, a passion instigator, academic, adult film performer, world class sexual adventurer, indeed, outspoken philosopher, and kink bondage coach. Has been blogging and writing about sex and spirit since 1998. And uh, you have books. I do. Have yeah, um, actually, part of today's discussion is coming out of a book that is now in second edition, Sacred Kink, The Eightfold Paths of BDSM and Beyond, which we might talk about more later, but was me arguing with my friend Raven Caldera about the topic. And so what do I do with my friends? I write massive books because um, like that's how some of our brains work. But I've also gotten to write pieces that are much shorter, such as the Toy Bag Guide to Age Play with Greenery Press, which is a tiny little thing that fits in your back pocket, to uh, getting to co-author Playing Well with Others, your field guide to discovering, exploring, and navigating the BDSM kink and leather community. And then beyond that, everything from rope work books to an erotic and sacred poetry collection, things on queer magic, and in general, I encourage folks to go over to my website, which is passionandsoul.com, and you can get the list of those and lots of anthologies I've been in, and in general, I spend a lot of time writing. I love it. And you're working on, working on a book, right? I am. It just got announced that it's coming out for thanks uh, for not Thanksgiving. That would be hilarious. And no, wrong. It's not finished. No, coming out for Valentine's Day is a book called Become Your Own Beloved, which is looking at self-love through the lens of externalizing ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I know I've said things to myself that I would never say to another human being or let myself say things to myself. I would never let another human being say to me. And so the book is about becoming your own friend and taking yourself out on dates and learning how to make a commitment to yourself and then in turn 
how to forgive yourself if things have not gone in a way that was healthy, happy, and whole for you. And then later on, uh, talking about relationships with other people in the context of also having a relationship with yourself, where basically I introduce people to poly theory, polyamory theory 101, but frame it in the language of monogamy. Nice, nice. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to your books coming, uh, next book coming out. And we've known each other a long, old time. Oh my God. It's wild. I was looking at some photographs recently of you having me all roped up in Kay Buckley's dungeon space in 03. And oh I was my like, goodness. Wow, time is strange. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I want to dive right into talking about. Um, consent and sacred sex or sacred kink and many of uh, many of my regulars my viewers know that and I, I mean this this uh, quite intentionally I am a devout atheist however that does not mean that I do not believe in the the intangible quality of humanness mm. and so I, I've had friends who are uh, more traditionally religious not be able to wrap their head around that I am uh, um, avidly, devoutly atheist, and yet to be able to cast my eye upon the stranger things between heaven and earth that are dreamt of in our philosophies. So mm -hmm. sacred kink, sacred sex, share with us what does that mean to you? And what does that mean in this situation? Yeah, so I think one of the key pieces you already alluded to, which is the notion of the sacred, that which is precious to us, that which lights us up, that which if it were done out of a specific context would feel wrong, de defiling, inappropriate, or harmful to that which is true to ourselves. I mean, you use the word atheist. It simply means not theistic, to not believe in a divine or a god. That I know a lot of people who are spiritual or believe in a sacred truth of their journey, something that is bigger than themselves or taps into lineage or something that has a deep specialness to them that are not theistic and some that are theistic and some that are polytheistic, believe in many divines or spirits or gods. And so I don't think that this notion of sacredness is held only by those who are theistic. For some folks it is, right? Their sacredness overlaps with a religion of some sort. But for other folks I know, sacred means precious a thing that you keep close to your heart or your cunt, whatever, wherever you keep it, right? Like it's special to you. And that specialness can turn into these places of altered states of consciousness, where when we're wholly in that, well, almost holy state, we're so in that it, it lights up and, and the world is more than it was before or different than it was before. And for me, when I talk about this notion of sacred kink, what will always be in my memory, the first time I ever had a public flogging, I'd agreed to do a pickup play scene with this guy at uh, Beyond, uh, Beyond the Edge Cafe in Seattle, back when that venue existed in the 90s, right? Mem uh, Elena, dear in our hearts. And this guy flirted with me and I'm like, yeah, sure. For folks who don't know, as a note, uh, I was assigned female at birth. And so this was a heterosexual flirtation or at least read as heterosexual. And he was hitting on the hot, big titted girl. And I was like, sure, I've never had a flogging in the ways you're talking about, let's do this. And I went into this place where time dilated. Right. I don't know if you've if you've had those moments or anybody in chat, if you had a time where time went in, right, things got like or time went out where it's like, wait, what do you mean? It's only been five minutes. Right. I'm curious if anybody else has had those time moments over in chat. But I had this time thing happen and it was the same emotional sensation 
as when I had danced naked in a grove with a group of Druids, as well as when I had prayed with a group of Pentecostals, like it was the same sensation. It was the same experience. And after the scene, I turned to him and I went on this whole rambly thing that I, you know, and said, it's like this. And the dude just went, it was just a flogging. <laughs> well, that, that actually illustrates a good point that you can have two people having the, uh, in the same time and space and having two very different experiences and it doesn't make it wrong but it does make it wrong to make the other person wrong exactly and so when we talk about sacred kink i had this deeply sacred moment wrapped in an experience of an altered state of consciousness right drugs were involved but unless you're kind of the drugs of the brain but i was wrapped in this altered state of consciousness i had had a profoundly sacred kink experience and i find when people use words like sacred kink it's up and down that dimension or other dimensions or can i show actually share a quote from oh z my God, please please um well, uh, before you do there is a yeah. question that relates to this um uh somebody asked can one believe in the divine without believing in any specific god or gods uh i i would argue yes uh because the labels that humanity interprets their experiences of the divine through, we are speaking in human tongues. And I would argue that the divine has a broader language or different language than we do. Um, human beings are pointing at a map trying to explain the actual geography. It's, we're pointing at the map. That's my personal philosophy. I don't know about yours. Nice, nice. All right, you were going to do a screen share. Yeah, so if folks are not familiar with Z and their work, check it out at embodymorelove.com. Like they're just amazing. But I pulled up this quote ahead of time that takes a different look at this notion of kink in general. But to me, I think also taps into the sacredness of kink, which is sexual desires behaviors and identities that challenge social approval, giving you the opportunity to explore your courage, shame, pleasure, and liberation. And when I heard Z say that for the first time, I, like I remember my heart expanding and going, that is the sacred work of what it is that we do. It's, it's the difference for me between play as in silly and play as in going to the theater to a place that moves our heart and right? the they both use the word play and go ahead can, please yeah and it can also be both yes yeah that's exactly it and so for some people sacred kink is those things that cross over to either spirituality or some sort of religious practice for some people, it's about kink that is dear and precious to our heart. And if someone else did it with us, it would feel defiling or wrong or inappropriate. And for other people, it is doing that work of the heart. That is, it is the play, but more than the play. Nice. So question. Mm. Um, so sacred sex. You've also, you've also, I've also heard you talk about ordeal journeys. I think you even have a presentation around that, right? So I want to dive straight into sacred sex and right. ordeal journey, uh, how sacred sex and ordeal journey um, might change what consent is or looks like, and maybe explain a little about ordeal journey, because I know I just skipped that part. Yeah, so the definition I use for an ordeal is something that is an intense challenge where we are going up to the edge of our thoughts of where we can go, that place where if we go beyond this, we're going to harm our, ourselves in some way, emotionally, physically, whatever, and going up to that place and then choosing to engage choosing to tap in with a thing that is hard for us and that we come out the other side changed. So an ordeal for one person might be sitting opposite you having a conversation, right? Like that would be an ordeal. 
while for other folks, it might be uncomfortable. And for other people, it's a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> right. And so like, I think of people in the kink community who look at folks on hook suspensions and go, oh my gosh, that must be some sort of intense ordeal experience. You're going to come out, change the other side. And I know other, like I, I literally did a hook suspension recently while I hung in midair and got a blow job. As you do, right? I know, it's spicy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's extreme. It's intense, but I would argue it's not an ordeal. I was still fully present. I was still in this moment, the ability to use a safe word, for example, or the ability to say clearly in English, I need to come down now we're still there mm -hmm. but for a lot of folks I know going into an ordeal of some sort the line of where and how do I say no can become blurry I, I think specifically of friends of mine who are Jewish who are having a bar mitzvah bar mitzvah bat mitzvah whichever and you could theoretically say no once you're up reading the Torah but you can't really, without the world getting really problematic or complicated or either internally or externally, mm -hmm. that in these moments of ordeal, the notion, the constructs of consent can become muddy or need to look, be looked at holistically. Yeah. Does that kind of answer in, into that question? In the, in the ordeal? Aspect. yeah um i'd like the i'd like to get unpacked a little more about mm. how it changes mm. we may not even know we're in an ordeal yes like that first flogging scene for you absolutely you had no idea and i would assume it was some sort of an ordeal I don't know if I would use that word for it. I would use a transformative experience. It was a surprising big deal. Surprising a surprising big, big deal. deal. Yes, I love that. Perfect. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, so, um, ordeal or sacred, sacred kink, sacred sex. And if you could talk a little more about how consent shifts and where it can get complicated especially if we have two partners who may be having different experience in the same time and space yeah one of the first things i look at is the idea of that we enter into altered states of consciousness and different folks get there in different ways right some people go into an altered state because of rituals and others because of breath work and others because of a really great rhythm of music playing right altered state of consciousness. And if we are used to navigating and negotiating consent from our quote, right and rational state of mind, our day-to-day -day consciousness, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are somehow altered now in some way, expecting someone to remember the word banana sprout. It's it's going to be tricky because your brain is not engaging in the same way. And add to that then sometimes the story that it's a, or not story, but sometimes the idea that this is a ritual or we've set this up to be specifically an intentional sacred sexuality or sacred kink experience. Now we have a layer of pressure or assumption of a plot line in combination with a quest for something deeper in combination with an altered state. And these together make some of the tools that a lot of folks are used to accessing around consent harder to reach and further away. It would be that uh, yeah. the pain part of safe, sane, consensual becomes becomes a bit of a fuzzy and and then there's the 
if we're not strictly, I'm going to put quotation marks around it, safe, sane, consensual, can we really consent becomes one of the questions. Um, I also uh, saw over here that somebody asked about why I am more quiet compared to Lee. Um, this is Lee's talk. I'm the one that's like picking their brain. So I'm learning to listen. So here we go. Um, Okay, the safe, sane, and consensual, that if you're not in your right mind, that you can't consent. That is something that's out there. That is a belief, and it's the argument that says, if you've had a drink, you can't consent. Or if you're drunk, you can't consent, right? Like that spectrum. Or if you are mentally uh, or neurologically non-normative and or what gets considered by societally mentally ill that you can't consent. And I know a lot of folks who look at my quest for spirit and the ways that I tap into my faith and look at me and go, you're crazy. And I've even had those words used at me or concerning me. And for the fact that I am a spiritual being, for the fact that I do have a faith and Therefore, if you are someone deemed crazy by a group of individuals or society, can you consent? Becomes that same kind of conversation, but from a different direction. Oh, and yes, I'm sorry that my volume is oh. uh, maybe less than, I, it's probably my mic. And anyway, I'm just kind of poking questions. So it's really more important that you can hear Lee. Um, well, and I love this question that gets asked, that there's this notion, oh, yeah. capacity impacts consent. So what is our capacity to communicate? What is our intellectual capacity? What is our sobriety? And I know a lot of folks that when they are in deep moments of, the, of, of tapping into the sacred or their own sacred, are not necessarily what would be deemed sober or of sober mind. Then how do we frame and deal with consent incidences? So I come from a school of thought concerning literal sobriety that it is both a spectrum and that it's around a harm reduction model rather than an outright saying never have a drink and play. Uh, and part of that is having been part of the Burning Man community. Part of that is having been involved in safety for folks and, and uh, harm reduction around drugs and alcohol in general. And I think it becomes a question of what are your philosophies in that direction? So point one, what's your philosophy? Because I've had people who flat out said with, to me, if there's a possibility you're going to go into a trance state or a meditative state, I don't know if I want to play with you. In the same way, there's people who don't want to play with folks who go nonverbal in their subspace. Mm -hmm. It's a similar question, right? If you're no longer going to be able to verbally communicate or even communicate outside of your own mind, can you consent at all? And do they want to play with you? But for me, under a harm reduction model, I look at the idea of instead of using communication tools that say, yes, I'm game, yes, I game, yes, I'm game, going the other direction, where if someone doesn't respond, opt down to a safer place in our play or opt down into what would be a place that I feel all right going if I'm not getting an active feedback stream from you. Can you tell a, tell a story? Can you paint a picture in a hypothetical situation to illustrate that better? Yeah. When I do rope bondage as a rigger, as the person doing the binding, I have people that I play with that go nonverbal and that will go inward to have a meditative or trance state. And so what I do is when I'm, I'm checking to see their circulation, I go up to their hands and I squeeze their hand because I'm checking on temperature. 
I'm checking on how fast the, you know, the change in their, um, their, either their temperature or skin tone, depending on whose body I'm involved with, right, and their body realities. Um, and then also what I'm checking for is do they squeeze back? Because if they squeeze back softly, I'm checking for, um, uh, for potential nerve and, and hand movement. But I'm also seeing, are they still here mentally and emotionally with me? Because if, they, if their hand drops, oh, I need to deal with this physiologically. But if they just kind of lay there like a limp rag, okay. I now, as the rigor, have a choice. Do I start wrapping up the scene? Do I, well, that was a joke and I didn't mean to. Anyway, do I, I know it, it's, these things happen in my mouth. I'm my inner dad joke heart. Um, like, do I wrap up the scene? Do I sit at a certain level where I consider it safe even with no feedback from them? Do I, in that moment, I've had this happen for me. I've had moments where somebody, instead of no squeezing back, I had somebody latch on my hand and squeeze for dear life, but their mouth wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, I need to address something, but some part of them is in an altered state of consciousness. Or the opposite, I've also had folks non-respond and it was really hard for me because how well did I know that partner? Have we played before? Do I trust that if something goes sideways, they will be able to roll, like figure it out with me? Like if there was a consent misunderstanding or a consent accident, I know this person well enough that we are going to be able to traverse it together and see and take care of one another on an emotional level. But if I have a non-responsive person, I've wrapped up scenes when people go into those almost, those inward and sometimes catatonic states because I don't know them. Mm -hmm. I don't trust that I won't fuck things up. I don't want to unintentionally cause a consent even an accident, not a consent violation necessarily, but I don't even want to cause a consent misunderstanding or accident because I care about them as a human being. And so to me, that's a thing that I've had happen a couple of times and had to make really hard decisions about. So, in that okay, so let's say you made that hard decision, right? And then say you and I are playing and you made that hard decision because uh, my communication or whatever capacity I had was not something that you could make sense of and let's say you call the scene mm -hmm. and then I come out of it and say oh I was fine we could have gone further I don't know why you stopped these conversations happen absolutely how would you, how would you respond yeah. to that um that's great to know I realized I didn't ask you what good looks like I only asked you what bad looks like I only set up a safe word if there was a problem. Now I know about you that good equals going to a trance state. So as a rigor, I want to know, how do I know it isn't good? How do I know that? And do you have a way to communicate it to me? And if the answer was, I, I don't have a way to communicate it to you, then I am now having to make an assessment. That person is making an assessment. In this case, you, you're making an assessment for yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you trust me to do whatever it is when you literally have only played with me this one time? Or is it a, oh, I haven't asked myself that question. It looks good when I am, uh, it looks bad when I actually start crying. So even though it's not verbal, I can look for tears. And now I know to start changing things or wrapping it up. I would like to, oh, Figueo, please. I would like to add for, for the viewers that essentially what you're talking about is on the top side, calling safe word. And yes. I don't think that gets talked enough. And if at this point, I was fine, I could have gone further, but you hit a point in which it was no longer fun because you had to do too much guesswork. You had to, uh, 
so people topping get to have a boundary. They get to have a safe word They in the same way. And I think sometimes a safe word ends up being assumed it's it's in the court of those bottoming. But no, it, it's in the court of people who are human. <laughs> Humans. So if somebody who's, who's topping you, dear viewers, is saying, I, I got to call it. I know you might be hungry. I know you might be more capable. You may have more stamina, emotional resiliency, internal understanding. But the other person said, done. And so does that, in either case, whether it's the person topping or bottoming, saying, done. Yeah, and that doesn't make that top not a good top. In fact, it makes that top somebody who knows their limits, boundaries, and will show up in their complete humanity. How sexy is that? I think it's incredibly sexy. Yeah, yeah. But I've yeah. also had people, uh, uh, like when we think about ordeals specifically, I negotiated with someone earlier this year about the fact that they want they had had a really rough breakup and they'd had some pieces where they had been doing a lot of self-examination and wanted to do a scene that was going to be physically and psychologically challenging to push them into some of their own personal shadow to do the emotional work that they didn't feel they can do with their therapist. They'd done a certain amount with their therapist, but they wanted to do more that involved their body. Mm -hmm. And I went, okay, tell me more. And over the course of two conversations, we talked about what that would look like, including the fact that they might go not just nonverbal, but they might go into a place where they emotionally weren't okay, where they were going to be really struggling. And with me as the technician and in the language, some of the language we were using their priest, what would that look like for me? What was my role if this person went into those places. And the negotiation for that kind of ritual sacred kink included for me things like, what is the number for your therapist if we need to have you call them? Because we're talking about playing with your mental health and this, your mental states. And also with them, one of the things that we looked at was what do we do if it goes really excellent? What if this was meant to be like a one-time thing, but like we fall in love, like that's an altered state of consciousness. Like what are our, we end up having a much broader conversation than a pickup scene because it was an ordeal working, including if you go nonverbal and I, as the person, as the technician or top, fuck it up in some way, right? Like I don't end up doing what is healthy and good for you. What's our plan? And those kinds of pre-work were necessary because we were playing with something that had a higher risk profile as it were than I'm meeting somebody at a play space, they're flogging me, we say thank you and we're done. And how to be prepared for when things go well and things go poorly. Um, I want to connect this with uh, um, the particular method of negotiation that I teach regularly because it connects directly into planning your aftercare for everyone in advance. Aftercare yeah. isn't just about uh, blankets, snuggles, uh, cleaning up things right afterwards. Think of aftercare as that which each individual needs for regaining equilibrium and equilibrium regaining equilibrium there's that which happens right afterwards uh, but then it may go in phases and the process of regaining equilibrium now if something goes really awesome or really poorly both are off equilibrium an yeah. awesome scene is not in a state of equilibrium because my state of equilibrium is I'm multitasking about deadlines and like looking at all the Q and A's and looking at the time and is it recording? This is not my peak experience. I adore you Lee, but this is a webinar. So yeah, 
Um, if I'm having a peak experience, an awesome experience, a bad experience, there's going to be a phase change. There's going to be a state change. And I'm going to need something to regain equilibrium, as would my partner. So planning aftercare in advance and not just looking at the, the kind of stereotypical blankets and cuddles, because I might not want cuddles. Who's it by? What does it entail? And does it go in any phases that the self and or the other should know about? And there's a lot of that can, and what you're talking about in terms of therapists, as well as how do we handle things when things go in an unexpected direction, good or bad. So yeah. planning your aftercare in advance, folks. Um, uh, put that in your head and think about what you might need. And it will change. There was a, um, Lee mentioned about risk profile and the context. Is it a pickup scene or is it a long negotiated transformative scene? These will vary what one needs for aftercare. And if you are on the receiving side or the bottoming side, ask the question that isn't often asked. Hey, person topping me, what do you need for aftercare? Big points. I'm going to add another thing uh, that, that connects here is what do I look like and sound like when it's good for me? What do I look like and sound like when it's not good for me? And yep. not good also includes boring. I'm checked out, uh, 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 thinking about the groceries. That's also not good. So not the, if I was to say to Lee that, oh, I'll, I'm happy. You'll know, you'll know it when you see it. doesn't say anything right but the the visible tangible observable symptoms because communication isn't just words when somebody goes nonverbal they are still communicating unless we're having a clinical dissociation i want to talk about that in a sec yeah and because we've got some comments in chat as well as a thing in q a about dissociation i would love to go there great um going nonverbal or having time dilation mm -hmm. or change in perception of time is different than dissociation. Yes. Uh, go, having a headspace like, woo, I can, can't see, well, but I can still squeeze your hand. Um, so what do I look like, sound like when it's good for me? What do I look like, sound like when it's not good for me? In concrete, tangible, observable. Also find out for the other person whether the other person is topping or bottoming. Let them know, like if I'm topping with rope, I often look like this when I'm having a good time. <laughs> right. I've had photos taken of me in mid play and I'm like, oh my God, I have a triple chin and I look like I'm constipated. Crap. Um, yeah, so it doesn't look like my happy face is my happy face. Oh my God. Um, so you can't make assumptions. So what do we look like, sound like? Get an inventory of that. If you don't know what it is, ask your partners. Now let's talk about dissociation since it came up. Go for it. Well, I, I, there's a piece that ties between these two that somebody asks over in chat that they say they disassociate during SM play because during rhythmic music, um, they will sometimes go nonverbal and lose motor control. I would argue that's not necessarily the same thing as dissociation. That there is, however, playing with that person who goes nonverbal and loses motor control. I am upping that risk profile because I'm not getting feedback. I think of myself for that reason as a 201 level bottom to play. I don't tend to bottom to people who have never done SM of any sort ever because I know I have what this person over in chat is talking about. I go nonverbal. I will sometimes get angry. I will throw things. I will not be a civil human being who can, you know, file their taxes. I, I am, I go into states that are not that. Therefore, when I say risk profile, I'm not saying not doing it. I'm saying that it is more there are going to be more things to keep in mind and more choices to make going for um, a 10 mile hike where you have to bring a backpack or somewhere you're gonna stay overnight than going for a walk down to the grocery store. They might both have the same shoes. 
They might both have, you know, they might both involve moving your body, which for some people with chronic pain in and of itself is a lot, right? But that's not the same necessarily as dissociation. Now, dissociation, on the other hand, have you ever heard Raven Caldera's car metaphor for no. dissociation? Bring, bring it on. So he introduced this theory around um, spirit possession and God work in a shamanic practice way. But his theory with, and I use it for role-playing and association is, are you in the driver's seat? Or are you in the passenger seat watching things, but you can grab the driver's wheel if you need to? Right, exactly. Or are you in the back seat? watching everything but can't really do much about it it's like well um that's happening or are you in the trunk and i've had scenes where i don't remember the scene i was in the trunk where i find out later that all this stuff happened and i'm like i got nothing to me looking at backseat and trunk is the conversations of different types of dissociation. That's Raven's analogy. I am so mm -hmm. going to borrow that. I'm so going to borrow that. Oh my God. That is so good. Um, and about dissociation versus headspace. I think sometimes the term dissociation gets used a little too loosely because actually dissociating in the trunk or in the backseat where you don't have control. We're not talking about just being nonverbal or time dilation or motor control shifting. There's somebody that said about when it happens, I need to stop. Um, and if that is something that you experience, that it's let the other person know. Also, if you experience a happy, fuzzy stone from play, which could look like I'm checked out, Mm -hmm. I'm actually just in the driver's seat going pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Where are we going? Can I can I get an ice cream? Um, but in that case, I need to explain to you what I'm looking like when I'm like having a fantastic headspace. If you know. For people who are just new to playing or new to playing with a partner or new to playing with a certain type of thing or doing it, because it doesn't have to be around SM, right? Sometimes the thing we have consented to, we won't know what it looks like or what its outcome will be until we're there. And for me, when that comes up, it's about profound self-care and owning that it's okay that we didn't know ahead of time. It's okay that we didn't expect that to happen. I had a scene happen that I'd negotiated for. Like I said, I'm transgender. And with somebody who was a very established top in the scene, I decided to, I, we agreed to do a, a bashing scene. I'm not gonna share any details. Um, afterwards, there was a lot of processing, but we were good, very solid. And then seven years later, I decided to pursue a medical transition. Mm -hmm. That whole scene, boom. The aftercare I thought that I needed, all of the stuff around it, everything that had happened in the scene, suddenly it was seven years later. And I am now doing this deeper work of the soul for a scene that the top never negotiated to be there for me having not talked to me for seven years, but I think a generousness of our own care for self that sometimes those aftercare moments or sometimes those pieces around altered state might come up long after a scene happened, especially if it's around a heated topic. Yeah, that sounds really intense. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a comment and then I want to look at the Q&A because there's some good stuff coming in around dissociation versus fuzzy headspace. Somebody mm -hmm. said sex drunk or kink drunk. I was uh, in a negotiation. It was actually a negotiation class and I was negotiating with an attendee. And this is something I commonly do. 
and mm -hmm. not to play, but as if to play, right? To show what it, how the flow goes. And as I was negotiating and we got to the question pretty early on, this was around rope bondage. What do you look like and sound like when it's good for you? And what do you look like and sound like? What will I see and hear when it's not good for you? And she stopped cold. And this is somebody who had been known as a, a hearty, experienced, tough, um, 201 level player, right? And she said, oh, I don't know. I don't remember anything when I'm play after or during play. I don't remember anything. Yeah. And this was a class. So we, we found discussion and solution appropriate around that. However, if this were actually in in a pickup play situation, even if I knew this person to be like a you know, hot at bottoming, at that point, I would have said, thank you. Uh, let's not play, but wanna grab dinner instead. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do want to name though, I've had play partners over the years who um, either have trauma responses and or have clinical dissociative identity disorder. And it didn't mean that person doesn't deserve to have kink. Correct. And, I was drawing a line. Right. And I yeah. love that that's your line. For me, it was okay. Do we need to have negotiation with multiples in the system? Not mm -hmm. just who's fronting right now. Right. And again, that's not I, who I would argue would be somebody that I would have a pickup scene with, but I would get that dinner that you just brought up and then right. say, but I do want to play with you. How do we make this happen for the future, right? How do we have all of us thrive in this, including if there are multiple of you in your system? And had that been a pickup play situation for me, I, I think I would have been like, let's go to, let's go to dinner. And like you said, um, let's back it up and enjoy some small steps. I don't think I would go to the spectacular scenes that she was known for, as she's known for. I think I would have gone for something incredibly simple and seemingly basic so I I could get to know her in play. Mm -hmm. um, let's get the Q&A here. There yeah, let's do here. it. We got a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, maybe we address this. I don't know. You tell me. I often dissociate during intense. Yeah, that's where I was coming from with that last answer. So, okay. yeah. Great. And then there is, uh, I think for me, stop the thing can sometimes feel more emotionally harmful, difficult, painful, potentially damaging than continuing. Abrupt disconnection is really challenging for me. How do you handle the emotional risk associated with stopping? Are you asking your top that too? The number of times I have had people say for it on me and I have felt emotionally disconnected and had to figure out how to do that. I see this statement from a lot of bottoms. Well, I don't want it to end quickly. How can we not have it end? I'm, I'm the bottom and you need to not drop me. If that is your thought process, apply it to everyone in a scene and have those conversations in advance for everyone. Oh, if something comes up and I need to be able to back out of this, what are some other things we can land to? So, oh, I as the top realize I need to have you not, like I can't have you go nonverbal because I don't feel safe anymore. I might, an example is, is come and be like, hey, are you there and start whispering in someone's ear? Come back here. I'm going to tie you up on my lap while you're looking me in the eyes and start easing it back into something that it does have you present because that's what I need as the top to feel safe in my consent. So that's one thought that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. for yourself? Well, let's see. I'm sitting them on lap and looking them in their eyes. That's nice. Can I just whack them with a rubber chicken? No. Okay. I don't know. I mean, is that sacred to you? 
have a sake do you have a sacred rubber chicken I, I actually have a custom made rubber chicken flogger multiple rubber chicken shot weight loaded it's, it's i love that you have a cat of many chickens that makes me so happy yeah because for me the sacred space is that of the fool i and love the, that and the comedy and the ludicrous and the absurd because in absurdity we get to reframe. However, um, back to the bit about um, how do you, you know, how do we reduce the, how the whiplash from an, uh, putting on the emergency brake to keep that car analogy going and right, discussing aftercare for good, for not good, and having that in advance gives gives people something to fall back on, something to fall back on. And like you were saying, when an emergency brake has to be put on, the whiplash may be experienced by all parties. And even the person who had to pull the emergency brake. Yeah. yeah, right. And so if what you know about yourself is, if emergency brakes get pulled, I get whiplash and I already have spinal trauma, right? That's that I'm communicating that if you pull this, it's not just an ow, it's uncomfortable. It's an ow, there's going to be harm on in some way to our relationship, to my body, to my spirit, whatever. Then sharing that uh, when we're talking about our aftercare process is so beautiful, because I can say I tend if whiplash happens, it hurts more. If things come up, what are some ideas we can brainstorm so the transition between our stop and our aftercare is smoother? Or so it's easier to pull out of my back pocket rather than have us be in that whiplash moment for a long time. And I think that aftercare period is a great place to share that information. Yeah, let me read the next one. And yeah. I think this leads nicely into it. What is too much pre-work for a scene? Is having someone join a therapy session for healing experience a line too far to make sure everyone's on the same page? So two extremes of negotiation style Number, that are both scenes I have been part of that had deep meaning to all parties involved, I have been told. First one was on a dance floor. I pulled a piece of parachute cord out of my back pocket, saw a guy from across the room, winked at him. He danced over to me. I tied his hands in front of him. We made out, I untied him, I pushed him away and he went back to his friends. End of scene. I don't know the guy's name, but super sexy. But look at all the places that could have gone sideways, right? But that's one end of how much negotiation was there. The other end, um, I did a ritual with someone and it was somebody who had, I'm going to mention uh, domestic assault, but I am not going to share any details in the following small story. Um, they had experienced domestic assault and had been working with their therapist for multiple years on how to process this. And they wanted to do a ritual of healing to let some of that go. My mother, because my mother was an artist, made me out of a bolt of muslin fabric, um, one and a half inch strips that were multi layers of muslin sewn together so I could do, have people write on those and I would suspend them in their own poetry and their words. And so I did a ritual with this person that we talked for months ahead of time. And they sat down with their therapist ahead of time, not with me personally, but their therapist and I had each other's phone numbers in case something came up. And they had scheduled that after, this, after the ritual slash scene, they were later that night talking to their therapist and it was pre-scheduled. Mm. And we did this ritual where they told me the story of this, of this relationship and abuse. And I wrote it all down on this fabric and we wrapped it around a suspension tripod. They went and baptized themselves in the local swimming pool, came back and then I suspended them in their own story. And then they cut themselves out of their story and left it behind. Amazing. But and, that was, oh, go ahead, please. And 
then there's also the dance floor scene. Two very different ends. So how much is too much to negotiate to me is such a unique question for each situation and that piece we brought up earlier where are you comfortable with your risk profile? There are people comfortable jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. Hey, it's not perfectly good if Air Force is piloting it, says <laughs> Army veteran. <laughs> oh my God, Army brat. Like, <laughs> you get it, right? You oh get my it. God, it's so real. It's Air so Force. Real. Um, um, <laughs> oh, I saw a great meme recently where it's like army was like, it was a group of, of four guys and the army guy was like jumping over the thing and the Marine was like doing push-ups on it. And the Navy guy was inspecting the pole and then doing a limbo underneath it. The Air Force person acknowledged the pole and then noticed that it ended one foot off the edge of the screen. They walked around it. <laughs> yep. 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 Mm -hmm. um, but there are people for whom high risk seeking world at large activities, perfectly acceptable, normal, and even, you know, free hand climbing up the sides of, of cliffs with no lines, they're happy for it. And other people where it's like, you know what, I wanna make sure I put on my back brace and make sure I've got good boots on if I'm gonna go dancing, etc. Like, so to look at your models in the world at large around your personal consent with your safety. And I think there's that informs our conversations around this stuff. I'm going to remind folks in the chat that if you do have a question directly for either of us, to if you would kindly put it in the Q&A, because otherwise it's just chat between y'all. Um, may I move on to the next one? Please, let's go for it. Um, aside, therapist, actually, Oh, so I coach individuals, right, around kink and stuff like that. And oftentimes in that very auntie kind of way, auntie Midori kind of way, I had one of my students, really fantastic human being, had me come in for a session with her therapist. And in mapping out the course of her future newly single erotic exploration. I was like, that was the best, oh my God. Right, it's so nourishing to have an individual have a support network that helps them thrive. And for some people, that's four friends. For other people, it's a therapist and their auntie Midori. Like we all get to create these structures that help us thrive so that when we give consent, we can do it from the fullness of who we are. I love that. It was so cool. All right, let me read the next one also. With safe wording on either side, how do you think about conditional consent? I will often negotiate things where I want X, but that's only worth the risk to me if Y is also included in the scene. That feels like it makes the communication, community, that makes the community belief that safe wording is always okay, really complicated. Mm -hmm. The obvious example for me here are that if I've negotiated a cutting and suturing scene, it's concerning to me if either party safe words out between the cutting and the suturing. Also, safe wording out between the scene proper and aftercare is complicated. I think there are more nuanced examples, but how do these things interact with anyone can safe word at any time? Well, that's what I meant by the bringing up the bar mitzvah earlier, right? Like you can't actually tap out of that without either, without looking at the fullness of what the repercussions of a situation would be. And when you're talking about between a cutting and a suturing, the repercussions of safe wording in that moment and tapping out of a scene are very high, up to and including death, right? Depending on amount of blood loss. Like, we need to look at the full repercussions of a situation. And if you know you're going to be doing a cutting and suturing, are you being mindful of what the repercussions are for different points? And have you pre-agreed that these are the points that we can't tap out of? If we get to this point, this point is necessary. I can't get 
halfway out. Uh, I get, can't get halfway down to the earth in my, uh, you know, while jumping out of that plane and be like, I'm done. Y you still got a ways to go. You, you can't, that is not physically possible. Or there's other situations that are logistically impossible, such as when people do um, contact chemicals to mucosal membranes, right? So things like uh, figging or people using Bengay under foreskins, et cetera. You, you can do things to minimize your suffering, but you can't, like you've hacked the hardware Unlike when we're talking about, I'm feeling emotionally uncomfortable, my software is being affected. If we're talking about activities that the hardware is involved with, it might be not possible to safe word. So I don't know if that, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one, gravity tops us all. So real. So real, so real. Um, yeah, and in physical risks, physical risk factors entangle with the emotional and mental risk factors. Mm -hmm. One can be perfectly emotionally fine, mentally fine, and bleeding out to death. Right. That is an isol isolating the physical risk part. So this is why there's consent dojo because it is never X or Y. I'd like to read the next one. Good one around uh, altered state. Speaking of, of the mind and psyche. What about playing under hypnosis? Still an, uh, I think, altered state. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm going to interpret this as what about playing under hypnosis? Yeah. Well, okay. Are we asking about the capacity? Let's assume that unless the person tells me otherwise, I'm going to assume for the capacity for consent and boundary setting under hypnosis. So literally there is one of the hypnosis conventions that has folded because of the di disagreements on those things in combination with active consent violations um, for folks who agreed to things once they were under hypnosis. Um, that they would not have consented to with a, quote, sober mind. Um, it is argued by some that hypnosis being in various forms of hypnotic state are simply a agreement to what would have been done otherwise, but your uh, ability to, like your desire, you, you were having reasons that you were not letting your truth desires out and that the hypnotic state allows for those, quote, internal or true desires to manifest. That is the same type of argument that is used for, oh, well, I know I don't do sexual, like have sex unless I'm completely drunk and don't remember it, but really, um, I guess it's okay now. I think there are parallels between those two conversations. And so... There's a couple of different questions I would ask as sub-questions, which are not for today's dojo, but um, I would consider how deep of a hypnotic state are they in? Do they have a hypnotic um, uh, reverse trigger that allows that person to be able to safe word out of their hypnosis? Because some people do post-hypnotic trigger um, embedding where the person who is being hypnotized still has the ability to get themselves out of trance, the, you know, pull cord if emergency um, kind of pieces. Uh, so I think there's a lot more complexity there, but I would look at it as a parallel conversation to alcohol. Yeah, hypnosis has gotten really popular in the last few years and interesting arena. I can't say I know enough to make informed comments on this. I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, there's another question here that I actually want clarification from the person who asked it. What if I don't want to grab the steering wheel unless under dire distress, dot, 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 would take away from the beauty? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to interpret that question. So if they want to clarify in the Q&A, that would be great. Or Lee, interpret it as how you wish. 
Uh, I would love that clarification, yeah. though, when I hear it, it's the part of, it reminds me of people who are rope recipients who don't want to know how it's done because that would take away the mystery of it. Don't tell me all the safety stuff. I just want to have the magic. Uh, and if you are the kind of person for whom the magic with no further details is what is desired, uh, to me, that would go back to negotiation at the, the top or sharing that information of, I to let you know, I am the cursed per kind of person who might go into a trance state during this play whatever it looks like that I am acting like, I am, I want to be in it. I don't, and this is a similar conversation to folks I know who say, I don't want safe words. Uh, it is, or I don't want the ability to communicate in any way, shape or form. Folks who say do full body immobilization with no ability to get out of it or even be physically hurt. Um, if you are of those categories of players, again, ups your risk profile, and everybody involved, I think, needs to have the ability to consent to that. Is everybody aware that that's who, who is playing in this moment? Are we doing play that is compatible with that style? Because um, it, so there is a play party that I sometimes go to that is a crossover between the BDSM and the rave community. And so there are people there who do um, ecstasy and other sorts of, of things. and. I've had people say, are you willing to play with me while I am on this substance? And I'm like, well, first, thank you for being transparent with me. I have gratitude for that. And then second, how much capacity do you have right now to share information slash how much experience? And then the third question, is it okay if I just tie your hands together in front of, your, in front of you and have people pet you? Because for me as a top, I am willing to physically touch this person, but 95% of my play off the table. But am I willing to put your hands tied in front of you and three of your friends pet you? Yes. In the same way, if somebody said, I want to have all of the, I want to be all mystery and all this, unless you're an established partner, this becomes this equation, right? Mm hmm yeah um not exactly the 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 rave and kink party but when i when i go and uh, hang out in places like torture garden in london yeah. and torture garden there's all sorts of drugs all oh, sorts yeah. of drugs all over the place and i don't think half the people know what they're taking my parameter of what i'm willing to play mm -hmm. even with people i know and certainly with people that just pick up is going to be considerably different not to mention it's loud and i can't the colors all sorts of colors so i can't see skin tone or facial expression really changes the threshold and the risk profile uh let's see i also want to give a heads up that we've got about 15 minutes so i may not be able to get to all the questions because i think you have a takeaway uh assignment or something similar to that to folks i see somebody said lee did i just see you sign a yes have you used asl as a workaround for nonverbal states or is or is non-communicative a better descriptor ah thank you uh i sometimes have default verbal language that is based on my experience as a hearing person what I meant to say was, do we have a shared form of communication? I have a play partner who is deaf. And so therefore their default language, one of the things they've told me when we were first starting to play was if I go to subspace, my spoken language goes away. I go into hand signing only because my primary form of communication is what my brain defaults to and their primary form of communication is ASL. And so that gift of how we can communicate, and so I've been trying to rebuild some of my ASL skills because I want to be able to communicate with them in scene. However, I also do know folks that use systems that be both people have in common. I have one person that I played with once in a while that had very little English, but had Spanish. 
as a pickup thing that we did once in a blue moon. And so I understood a little bit of Spanish. They understood a little bit of English. But what we did have in common was the ability to, if we had a problem, to use as co-creation. I don't know if you know Co, the author of My Heart Holds Many on parenting and, and polyamory. It's an amazing book if you haven't read it. Um, but Co states that safe words work best or shared communication systems in scene work best if you have one syllable. Right? So we had the ability to go ah eh, or a. Eh. Right? I didn't need to know what they were going to say. It's just, oh, which is what red does, which is what green does. And so do we have a shared communication system? Mm -hmm. Here's a really good one. Uh, I didn't quite get how you might negotiate in advance how to navigate staying connected if someone's safe words so nobody feels dropped. Uh, uh, could you give that example again? And here I assume dropped means like neglected as opposed yeah. to just like the dopamine drop. Uh, one of the tools that I use um, is love languages, finding out people's systems ahead of time that if somebody is uh, receives affection and hears it as it were, like notices their affection through touch, affection or love, Oh, I know that my partner cares about me because they hold me, they touch me. Um, if I know that ahead of time, a landing tool might be to hold someone. We've stopped our kink activity or we've stopped our sex activity, but I'm still holding your hand or I'm brushing your hair. If somebody is a words of affirmation person, I will say, thank you for so much play we got to have. I really appreciate us wrapping this up. You know, like those kinds of, that's one of the things I think about. Yeah, that's nice. I've also recently realized that I am a emojis of affirmation person. I love that. So good. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of my, um, for folks who know me after playing, um, I don't, necessarily need like an essay we might actually be too busy because everybody's like leaving dark odyssey in every which direction or whatever it's like just send me an emoji puzzle i love that emojis of affirmation i love that so much <laughs> yeah and and even something like that if you're someone or the of, or the group of you if you were having a group ritual went into a deep trance state where all of you want to be able to know, did we all consent to what just happened? Are we all still good? Something like a group chat system where one person has a little heart emoji, another person follows it up with the little angel, somebody else follows it up with the, um, a crown and a whole lot of stars. Maybe you don't want to sit down and have, because some people love after scene, scene reports, but for other folks, it's, did we hear from everyone? Are we all okay? And if folks aren't okay, is there a clear system set for us to check in with each other and be able to move this into a place of health and well-being? Nice. And next... Is it possible to prevent whiplash through learning to or learning to or being a better driver or better passenger? How I am interpreting that question is this idea of actually let me offer a metaphor. I was just talking of the, using this metaphor with um, with one of my my lovers, and they're a weightlifter. And we were talking about how hard it is to share things that are deeply emotional, especially for cisgender men who were not trained in how to do stuff right early on. And he's a weightlifter. And so I said, you know what? Sometimes it really sucks if you haven't warmed up to try to do that 400 pound deadlift that you can do. And he was like, yeah, it really sucks. You can totally mess up your back, et cetera. And I'm like, but is it easier if you do some warm up ahead of time? Like, you know, spend an hour at the gym before you do that. And he's like, absolutely. And I'm like, and 
what did it take to get to a point where you can do a 400 pound deadlift? And he paused and went, right. I started with doing 50 pound deadlifts. I said, yes. So weightlifting is kind of like emotions. How we stop having that whiplash is we practice what it's like to say no, or I would like to check in or pause when it's the equivalent of a five pound dumbbell. What's the last time you practiced saying no, or even more so hearing no? When's the last time you heard no and didn't have whiplash? And practice what it's like to hear no. And that's, that's what I would offer as an exercise for that. Um, Marsha B has a great exercise of not just the yes and, but the no but. Ask I the third. That. Yeah, no but. So the exercise is about getting used to hearing a no and then a counter suggestion. Uh, so it could be, well, so in the earlier example of the person who dissociated, it was a no but can we dinner? Yes. So it could be, you know, hey, uh, oh, let me do this to you, Lee. Um, and this is an actual exercise that Marsha has. It's great. Um, hey, Lee, can I um, cover you in, slather you in honey and unleash five wild ferrets on you? I'm not feeling up for that today, but how do you feel about eating some honey with dessert okay exactly so just like that um now and because it's you asking that's why i put the caveat of like not today <laughs> i feel like i need more information yeah and did i actually specify that they were actually four-legged ferrets well, because I actually have a former play partner of mine, a former girlfriend of mine, who identified as a human ferret. Her safe word was to take one of those light up jingly balls and chuck it at me full force because ferrets are assholes. Yes, yeah, ferrets are absolutely assholes. And they also collect and eat silicone dildos. I wonder why I know this. I, okay. I love that you know this. Thank yeah. you for passing this on to the collective wisdom of our community. Yeah. <laughs> um, Oh dear, it is also approaching that time. And can you, are you able to take a quick look, see in the Q and A, if there's one that that's like, yeah. a hole in your not drawing a scene, can it be reversed a week later? So there is a question about the uh, idea of reversing consent a long time later. And it's, the, it's very confusing if somebody a week later or multiple years later revokes consent. I think that would be a fantastic topic, Midori, for you to be able to, because I think that in of itself would be yeah. an amazing conversation in and of itself. Um, whether it's me, or there's a couple of people I can think of at, um, uh, anyway, we can talk about that. I think that would be a whole thing in and of itself. That would be a rich discussion. If, if um, I can ask of uh, our moderator to copy that question, and if you have suggestions on who would be good for tackling that. I would love to be connected. And I would love to actually wrap with a piece that's um, one of the questions on here that says, on behalf of another, which I love it when friends ask for friends, um, how do you start a conversation to engage a partner in this type of deeper reasons for play? One of the first things I do when I want to engage someone else is I, as the person who wants to bring it up, literally journal or talk with friends about it. I will ask myself, why do I want to do it? What are my reasons? And I might not come up with all the answers, but doing that piece by myself, literally in a journal, or if you're not a writer, having an audio recording that you can talk to yourself. The piece that I do is actually an exercise out of the artist's way of um, morning pages where you start out writing with no, just start writing about the topic. And it sounds like just, it's starting the process of writing 
because I won't oftentimes find my own answer for myself until a page and a half later, if then. Mm -hmm. And me doing that work with myself has made it so much easier to bring it up, especially when I'm building rituals with other people, because suddenly I can go to that co-ritualist or go to my circle or go to the person I want to do a deep scene with and say, I've been looking to do a scene that would be an opportunity for me to be vulnerable with another person. An idea I had for that involved doing suspension bondage. Would you be open to a discussion about a vulnerable scene? And if the person says to me, I'm open to a vulnerable scene, but I don't know if suspension bondage is the right tool for me, what I have is on the table that what I'm actually looking for is about the vulnerability. The suspension bondage was just my first volley. It was just the first idea on the table. But me doing that work to realize, oh, this is about vulnerability has helped me build those conversations smoother. Beautiful. We have just a few minutes and I want to turn this over to you as to however you might want to close today's and this month's uh, consent dojo. If you want to give them an exercise or a thought or whatever, I wish for you to close it out as you wish. Oh, and folks, for those of you who are here live, stick around just a second after I, just a moment after I stop the recording and uh, we'll have a, we'll have a little chat after that. So. Lee. Thank you so much first for having me here. And if folks want to follow up on this work, you can find my stuff at passionandsoul.com. My uh, Patreon, which is also forward slash passion and soul. Or if you want to read more on specifically sacred kink, um, I have a book out on the topic. And if my hope for you would be this, practice saying to yourself your yeses. Practice saying to yourself your noes. And practice saying to yourself your no buts and your yes ands. Or the other direction that was just brought up. Mm -hmm. Because when I started saying to myself, yeah, I do want a frozen yogurt today or saying to myself, you know what? I actually just brought up with my own head the idea that I want frozen yogurt because somebody else mentioned it. I actually really want cheese. Practicing those things with myself without anyone else around started building those muscles. And that is the exercise I hope you can try out if you've never done them before. 